How about now? Yes. Good evening. Thank you so much for waiting for us. Um, we'll be ready for the session. Call me in order of the assessor. Right. We can stand for the pledge. We do. All of you, come here, please. All of you, come here, please. Can you give us a microphone? Yes. yes. change and order of agenda. Madam I Chair. I believe we do have some items. Go ahead. Chair, yes. we have a roll call, please. Oh, did I skip that? I apologize. I want to get to business. Roll call, please. Ms. Blanco? Here. Mr. Molina? Here. Mr. Mason? Here. Mr. Martinez? Here. Dr. Sanchez? Here. Okay. Now adoption uh, change uh, order of agenda. I believe F4 needs to be tabled to December. Also H1. And I believe that's it. Correct? Yes. Okay. Good chair. Yes. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
passed away earlier this month. And also included in that for the victims of the B, um, uh, B fire. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. And Plum does come speak.
and it's a big responsibility to be on the school board. And so thank you for putting yourself forward for, for both of those. Um, as Elmer mentioned, uh, this is a, a uh, resolution uh, on behalf of Assemblymember Kevin Mullen and Senator Jerry Hill. There are a number of whereas clauses here which explain all the wonderful things that John has done um, and, and what kind of person he is. And I'll just read the very end as it concludes. Resolved by Assemblymember Kevin Mullen and Senator Jerry Hill that they join with the members of the San Bruno Park School District Board of Trustees in commending John Marinos for his outstanding leadership and efforts to enhance the quality of education within the district and convey to him best wishes for a future filled with continued success. Assemblymember Kevin Mullen and State Senator Jerry Hill. Thank you. Thanks, John. to acknowledge and recognize our colleague, John Marinos. Um, I'd just like to let him know that uh, you will be missed. You were my partner in crime this time around all of you. You were on the board. Previous my partner in crime was Mr. Uh, the Honorable Mr. James Prescott, which I uh, missed dearly as well, and you're gonna be missed. So, um, thank you, John, and um, you're gonna be missed, and we appreciate everything that you've contributed to our community. Um, if the rest of my colleagues would like to say a little something, and we also have a little something for you as well. Thank you, Jennifer. For the chair, John Marinas, you're an amazing guy. You're hardworking. Uh, you bring a lot of heart to the position of a trustee, and I want to thank you as a new trustee that uh, you grandfathered in a lot of caring and emotionality to the job. Thank you. Thank you. But also your um, uh, outreach, always to the uh, community and bringing back to the board, um, you know, all of your experiences um, to enhance our 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 work. You know, it's um, out to every school site and, and um, many many events, and uh, both as the board's ambassador out, but also bringing back to us because you you know just being a real good listener. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you for your years of uh, service, John. Um, I think uh, reaching out to the community as well as we went through uh, three superintendents at this, through this juncture, because there's a lot of things going on, but I think uh, the fiscal solvency was an issue during your tenure that's going to make difficult decisions that you're part of. So thank you very much for your service to the district and the community of San Bruno. Thank you. These are individuals who support the district's core values, uh, the whole child, teamwork and collaboration, ethical behavior, respect, innovation and creativity and accountability. And so difference makers come to us through nominations, through the school principal and the leadership teams of the school. Sometimes the teachers get me a nomination of staff. 
without going through the principal and, and so on. So, uh, but they come to the district office and then at the board meeting we recognize these individuals. So, um, I'm Carrie here to help me with this this evening. And so, so the first individual we'd like to call forward is Javier Mandala Rivera. Javier, can you come forward, please? And so I want to read this to you and present you with a certificate. We'll take some pictures and whatnot. Javier has been a committed custodian and community member for many years. In fact, I saw him on um, Halloween uh, cooking for the, for, the, for the Halloween party. He's always happy and ready to help. He has been a positive factor in, in helping support the new recycling and composting efforts at the school and is resourceful in finding ways to make almost anything happen at the school facilities. He goes beyond the workday, participates, and helps out in all Bel Air community events. After hours on the weekends, he's unofficially on call 24-7 and ready to help the school. We're proud to name you as our difference maker. So I, the next individual I met uh, last year when I came on board, and I love going into her classroom. Um, and over the last year, we've had an opportunity to work together, and I think that she is going to be a fine administrator one of these days. If I can just get her to come over to the dark side, Sarah Marie Melendez. working on her admin credential right now. She just uh, has done some projects to engage the community at Bel Air and we went out and, was, and, and got to see that. And so she's committed a lot of her time. And when you go into her classroom, there's this warm feeling, there's music and the children are so actively engaged in developing their language and becoming scholars. Um, so you've been, and here's, let me read what the principal wrote and sent in to us. Um, you've been the most wonderful kindergarten teacher at Bel Air for many years for several years as a lifelong San Bruno community member. A student at El Crystal, Parkside of Cappuccino, you've been instrumental in planning two of our most recent community events, the Health Fair and the Fall Festival, in this past month. This is going above and beyond, truly. You're a positive support for our families and our students, and we're proud and honored to recognize you as a difference maker. San Bruno product, oh, I'm sorry, I need to shock you. San Bruno product right here before us. Well done, and congratulations. Okay, so, uh, so, so we're going to take a 10 minute break from the meeting, and we will resume in 10 minutes after the cake cutting. The ceremony of Mr. Trustee Molinas. to bring the vision for Schools with Tomorrow on site to life. The, the decision that we have to make, uh, that we have to make in order to create this reality is tough. And while some of the decisions in hindsight are not always 100% right, or in hindsight that the path could have been a better one, always happens. Decisions are based on data that we have at the time that the decision is made. For our district, as long as we are focused on the vision to make San Bruno Park Schools outstanding, 
we're headed in the right direction. I'm grateful for being allowed to share my passion for this work and to develop this passion in others, our principals, our teachers, and our community. This is really awesome. These past few weeks have been tremendously busy across the district and in the San Bruno Park uh, community, in the San Bruno community. I want to thank our community for their support on Measure X. 67.7%. This doesn't happen without the grassroots support across the community to engage one-on-one -on -one with, with each other. I'm grateful to our fearless Measure X committee and the chairs, Kathy and Wendy, for the tireless work behind the scenes, hours upon hours of fundraising, developing and implementing communication plans, phone calling, and canvassing the San Bruno neighborhoods. Behind the scenes every day, Kathy Cannon, Wendy Al McDodd, Dave Pine, Jim Wayne, Dave Nigel, Kenny Barra, Judy Puccini, Paul Desario, Liz McManus, Paul Linden, Harry Chavez, and most importantly, Nancy Krause. The list goes on. We are now turning the page to start a new chapter in San Bruno Park and in our schools. In the course of our transformation work, we are building a team, our community of stakeholders, teachers, parents, support staff, principals, and board members who possess the skills and mindsets to bring the vision to life. As such, leadership development is the heart of organizational improvement. Through a grant from Google, this past month, our principals attended for the first time a leadership conference to support the programming of our PLCs and instructional program transformation. Because of the election, I was unable to accompany our group, which included Dr. Rogers, who will be giving an update this evening on the conference. Having a community of funders to support the vision of our transformation work is tremendous. Thank you to Google YouTube for supporting and bringing in programs like CS First and supporting the development of our principal leadership, to the Welsh Foundation, to the San Bruno Education Foundation, and the San Bruno Community Foundation. We could not do this without you. This past month, we started and completed negotiations with our CSA chapter in record time. This points to the efforts to maintain the communication channels and strong relationships between our classified team and management, an ongoing relationship with monthly meetings and collaborative conversations and a win-win approach to problem solving for issues presented to us. Thank you to all of you for making this happen. Since the last meeting, the board has completed my evaluation for the 17-18 school year, and I want to express my thanks for their comments, and I look forward to continuing to work with the board as we implement the principles of a highly effective governance team. Some of the community and district events I attended in the past month include the Halloween dance at Bel Air, the Rotary Kiwanis Club meetings, Battle of the Strip Luncheon, the County Superintendent Ann Campbell's Retirement Reception, meeting with Flint Peninsula Healthcare District, our calendar committee who has finalized, the, putting the final touches on the 1920 and 2021 calendars, and our PTA President's Council. And last night I attended the City Council meeting to give an update on the state of the district. One of the events that also happened our street recently was with a trustee Marino Sanchez Martinez and elected uh, trustee elect uh, Chavez as I attended the music in the air that was held at Cappuccino on November 3rd. Students from the elementary, park sites, and park site schools performed alongside outstanding musicians from Cappuccino. There were guest performances by an opera singer from New York and a local jazz ensemble. The concert was free to the public for the purpose of showcasing the results of the music initiative in our public schools launched with nearly $500,000 from the Community Foundation to our Education Foundation and the Cap, Cap Alumni Association. While a team of volunteers work behind the scenes to make the concert happen, I want to express the district's gratitude to parent Brian Netherlook and his leadership for moving this initiative forward and chairing the, con the concert committee. An event for donors was held last Friday at YouTube to sustain funding for music. Special thanks to the sponsors and the uh, sponsors YouTube, Welch Family Foundation, Marshall Realty, and the Tamperin Gas Station. In closing, I want to just thank Trustee Marinas for five years of service to this board and the community. We were in the back trying to calculate how many hours <laughs> and if he wrote it off his taxes. I appreciate the candor of our conversation at Starbucks at 8.30 in the morning and the insight on what he hears from the community about our schools. And in closing, I want to wish everyone a nice Thanksgiving holiday and safe travels to those who venture out of town. This is my report. Okay, so we move on to staff reports. Who's going to go first? Mm -hmm. Valerie? I hope it's nice a little bit longer. <laughs> Good evening, President.
President Blanco and trustees, there have been many exciting happenings in the Health Services Department since we met last. Thank you. In October, our teachers participate in, participated in a report card training for Illuminate. The Curriculum Council has met monthly throughout this school year and has been instrumental in increasing communication between the district and the school sites. They have taken on the role of site liaisons for the refinement of our assessment matrix, our curriculum adoptions, and the implementation of Imagine Learning. The Curriculum Council has developed a timeline and process for piloting, piloting new adoptions in both history, social science, and science that align with new standards and frameworks in these content areas. We have a full team of teachers who have volunteered to pilot these new curriculum. During the past month, we have completed our first district-wide benchmark window for English language arts and mathematics assessments, and our principals have engaged in collective analysis of this data. Using statewide ELA and math assessment data, we have identified fourth grade students who qualify for the district's gifted and talented education program, and have developed a referral process for teachers and parents of other fourth graders who would like to request these assessments will take place during uh, December before we leave for winter break. Ed Service has also begun the in-depth feasibility analysis for offering a dual immersion program in San Bruno Park. A report will be forthcoming to the board in February. We have continued to collaborate with technology services to fine-tune the Illuminate gradebook and report card functions with the Illuminate developer. We have also begun the planning phases for summer school, particularly around expanding math programs for our rising fifth graders. At the end of October, we held our first superintendent's advisory committee meeting. We had a great turnout, including student representation and parents' guardians of um, representing students falling into one or more of the unduplicated people's category. Other stakeholders in attendance included community members, board members, teaching staff, administration, mental health professionals, business services, special services, early education, and technology. <coughs> the team had an opportunity to analyze our most recent state and assessment data, our progress towards meeting our LCAP goals, and to provide input uh, regarding our annual surveys to students, staff, and parents in the community. As Dr. Kemp mentioned, during the first weekend of November, four of our conference in Atlanta. During this conference, our team had an opportunity to learn about vision-driven leadership as an organization, as instructional leaders, and the impact that that has on teaching and learning. Our team reflected upon our current practices in the development of a system-wide approach to increasing rigor, relevance, and developing relationships with students. Following the conference, our leaders met together and determined goals for the district as well as actions and services to support district-wide initiatives. Last evening, we held our second DLAC meeting of, this, of the year and have representation for more than half the committee members. During the committee, I'm sorry, during the meeting, the committee received training on the goals and responsibilities of the DLAC and had an opportunity to review and adopt bylaws. Additionally, the DLAC had an opportunity to advise upon our annual parent survey and provide recommendations for increasing parent participation on the survey. This is my report from Ed Service. Thank you. Any questions for Valerie on her report? Yes. Yes? Oh, I thought you were still asking. I'm asking the board if there's any questions. Oh. Um, yes, uh, for the chair. Um, last last month, you spoke about that report you gave that had um, the what was the acronym again? C S A P. The um, CASP. The C A S P. Thank you. A S P. Can you talk a little bit about the school site planning? Um, kind of like the sub goals that came out of that report. Out of the the CASP. Mm -hmm. So each school looks at their individual data. Um, and they develop a school, a single plan for student achievement at the SIPSA. So that's developed generally in the spring before the school year and then revised with the new year's CASP data. So the data that they utilize when they're first developing the plan is about one 
year old. Um, and now as they go through that revision process, much like the LCAP process, they look at that data from the spring, as well as current um, student measures to develop their goals. Um, one of the reasons why we're expanding the math program to fifth graders is that we saw um, a decrease in, in fifth grade math scores district-wide. Um, in terms of at the school sites, the responsibility of revising the single plan is a function of the school site council. Sure. So each of their school site councils reevaluates their goals throughout the year and the actions that they're taking towards those. Um, every school plan is aligned with our LCAP, so our LCAP is based on those three goals around um, conditions of learning, student achievement, and engagement. And so all of the school plans are aligned to those three areas. In the second area is where they take into consideration those CASP measures, which in the CASP includes the, the California Alternate Exam, which is given to students with severe disabilities, as well as the SBAC, which is the Smart Balance Assessment for Computer Adaptive Test, and the Science Test. This year will be the first year that those scores count towards accountability measures. Thank you. Um, this, the school site, um, you mentioned in the springtime, Will that be visible to the board? Will we be able to get a presentation on that? Or? Uh, yes, those were presented, or those were uh, approved at the last board meeting of the school year. Okay. So, if I could just step in for a moment. So, there is a site for the schools to develop their plan. It's in alignment with the budget development and the LCAP development. And so, each year in June, the uh, school plans are brought forward to the board uh, that have been developed from the school site. It happens at the last June board meeting. The challenge is, is that they develop these plans in anticipation of what the score is going to be. And so um, this is why we have implemented our, uh, our local progress monitoring um, data process. And, um, and on top of that, um, as we have each school come and present their, um, their school data and their plan, they're going to be giving an update on what those modifications have been to their school plans. Yes. Is there any balance in any discussion at the state level of getting the scores sooner? Well, the fortunate thing we have is that we're able to see the, the scores for the multiple choice per portions of the computer adaptive test pretty quickly, but they don't give us um, a general idea of how we meet the, the accountability measures because it's not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It doesn't give us written part, which is the most rigorous part of the test, because those aren't scored, those are still hand scores. So um, the state does release those generally in October, the test scores. There hasn't been much discussion about releasing those earlier. And the reason I'm bringing up because you have, it's out of sync with the cycle that the state would want to either decide to move the, the assessment earlier Should be obviously a reflection of what the cast is going to do from now. It should be similar. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have some comments. Valerie, um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I'll deal with this first. So I know that in the past I have mentioned the inclusion of parents that represent the undupli unduplicated. They still are absent at these committee meetings. Um, once again, they're not at the SAC meeting that was um, previously um, called the LCAP Advisory Committee. Um, this demographic of our community is still not participating, not included in this activity. 
also in the BLAC, um, the meeting last night, they also are absent once again. Um, I tend to say this year after year. Um, I know I, I know records are coming back. I know they're coming back, but I have become a broken record here up on the board, um, speaking about um, including the inclusion of these parents in our committees. Uh, I did bring my California Ed Code book, and I want to cite the Ed Code regarding parent advisory committees. Uh, I'm not going to read all of it. It's uh, Ed Code 52063, Section 2. I need these now. I gotta bring in, I gotta bring my glasses now because I don't have John's to borrow anymore. It says a, <clears throat> a parent advisory committee shall include parents or legal guardians of pupils to whom one or more of the definitions in section 42238.01 applies. And in section 42238.01, that ed code references the makeup of these such committees, it's very lengthy. I'm not going to read it all, but it's unduplicated students, foster review, students of uh, parents of English language learners, parents um, of students who are um, <coughs> of low, uh, <coughs> low income population, and uh, we're, we're not adhering to our, to our um, ed codes. So uh, that was 42238.01. And so I really feel that, you know, I don't feel we need to do better in this area. We need to uh, include our parents. I know that this is gonna be a struggle as in the past, we've had parents represent these, this uh, population of, us, of our community. But what has happened is they have come but they come and first of all, there's not, there's trainings not provided, so they really don't understand the full scope of what their roles and responsibilities are at these meetings, so therefore they aren't effective parent leaders. And also we need to ensure that there's translation if the need, uh, if there is a need. And also their input. When, in previous years we've had parents have attend, but they end up dropping off like flies because they don't feel like they're being included, they're being heard. So therefore, they have shared with me, they say, well, why do I come, Jennifer, for what? You guys are just gonna go ahead and do what you wanna do anyways. Why do I come? So we really need to do better. We have to do better. It's in the Ed Code, and um, I will keep signing these Ed Codes, keep reading my books so I can, I don't remember these. These ed codes, that's why I bring the book and that's why I reference it because we as a board, we need to do right by these families. So um, the other thing is um, I do remember in the beginning of my term as president of the board, I have requested to have included in the board packet under committee reports to include agenda, the agendas of such com whatever committees and any materials and minutes. So once again, I'm requesting to include this information in the uh, uh, board, board agenda packet so that the community, regardless whether they attend these meetings or not, the fact that we are being transparent, we are keeping our community informed um, so that they can see what business is that we're talking about here within our committees, and um, we, we preach transparency. This is a good way, in that dire a good path in that direction. So, um, hopefully, uh, next month's meeting we can see that change in our board packet. That's all I have for this uh, under committee report. Then, chair. Yes. I just want to check a couple. Back to what you said, because I think I heard that the DLAC meeting had 100% participation at an earlier meeting. At an earlier um, And then now those drop off at this meeting. Right? Well, and so it's not that the parents, it's not like the community's grown by twice. 
they actually, there were parents that were there, and now we're not, so it's not that the parents were not included. So, and during last year, we had 100% participation at our final um, three DLAC meetings that I was here for. Um, the, the thing with DLAC is there are representatives that are elected by the school sites DLAC, and so as terms end, they need to um, elect new officers, and so that kind of uh, shifts the persons that are serving on the DLAC committee. We did have a quorum um, at our DLAC meeting, but um, in all of the parents who were represented, represented either DL or RFS students as required. The, um What, what I see happen this year, again this year, is our schools are starting a little late and getting parents involved in their ELAPS. Um, so from what I understood at last night's meeting, um, they have yet to have the first ELAC meeting. We're already at the end of November. Um, and so the parents I saw there, maybe one, was a, uh, a member representing this, this committee, this demographic of uh, parents, but with schools like Bel and Allen and Parkside, I think we should have more. In the Ed Code, it says one or more. So for me, it's more the merrier to get the more input. And at last night's, I think may, it just may have been one, but we need to have more participation from this, com this um, part of our community. Right, I just wanted to check that, that, that the prior month there had been 100%. Well, there was corn, I'm not saying, I'm but not also talking about there corn. Was, I think I heard that, that last time included training, which... Yes, the roles and responsibilities training was included as part of last night's meeting. So it's not that it was absent, or not that there was, not, right? I mean, I understand that there's a mess, well, um, you know what, I, I actually will bring, at next month's meeting, um, I meant to, I will be bringing these head codes back and have a more uh, discussion on it. It didn't make this month's agenda, but for next month it will. So um, if we can hold those comments and questions. I just wanted to bring that out there now. Well, if you put it out, then you're raising well, questions. Yeah. No, no, I said that was my comments. I didn't ask for a discussion, so. Well, um, yeah, I just wanted to put it out there, but I got now you know now that we will be we will be able to have a more robust conversation about these ed codes and the part parent participation from the demographics of our community. So, um, okay, I believe you're next. Thank you, Dominic. Unfortunate thing was the uh, piece of equipment that 
had to get replaced. When it came and they replaced it, they found out it was bad. So we had to replace it again. But once they got that uh, piece in, um, it started up and we were back up and running and had to get it into the cellar for IT. And this, e this evening we are also going to be um, introducing um, the, uh, the new IT or director of uh, technology. And so we're really excited looking for, forward to that. Um, then maintenance, operations, transportation is running very well. They're doing a lot of routine repairs and that's going on currently. Um, we're going to have a more uh, involved information on that. I think it's scheduled for January. And other than that, we're still working as hard as we possibly can to make sure everything is going smoothly as far as business services are concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So Sarah Nash sent me her update. Um, she has this flu, so um, I encourage everyone to get your flu shot. She's been sick, pretty sick for a few days now. Um, so on behalf of Sarah, uh, it's been a busy time for the year in the special education department. Uh, we held our first special education district advisory group meeting on November the 6th. Uh, we are happy to report that representatives from all six school sites, county programs, and the preschool signed up to participate in CDAG. In addition to ongoing CDAG meetings, we'll be holding monthly parent meetings for our community at large. A solution to our staff shortage for a speech at the Parkside and Parkside and a preschool has been reached and the providers are currently working to build a service schedule and begin to tackle the compensatory minutes. We are seeking an adaptive PE specialist for the district. In addition, one of our RSP teachers at Parkside recently resigned and we are seeking a replacement for her. In student services, we're wrapping up all of our vision and hearing screens at each school site for the mandatory grades, kindergarten, second, fifth, and eighth. We're also beginning to um, getting all the forms ready for TK and kinder registration, as, as well as the inter and intra district transfers for the 1920 school year. The forms will be available to families on our website in January. Okay, thank you very much. Any correspondence? No? Communications from the board? Did one of the ones they still mentioned was one of the larger ones they handled was actually did involve San Bruno um, with um, the Marymount area um, where the residents voted to um, join the San Bruno Park and San Mateo Union High School District. 
Um, they also set the size of the election area when elections uh, need to um, occur to um, effect those transfers that um, are, are brought forward by petitions. So it's, it's quite extensive, and the, the people that are uh, involved with it, it, it really entails another whole uh, meeting per month to primarily board members um, that, that serve on it. Um, from our area, the uh, candidate that went forward was Greg Dennis from um, Hillsborough City School District, and one uh, position stayed vacant, where the, um, in which case now the um, super, uh, county superintendent will uh, make that appointment. That's it. Okay. Okay. Were there, there any committee reports? There was a policy committee that, um, that John and I attended with Stella. So it's right down here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you. I apologize. You skipped that one. As you can see, these scores are not quite as low 
as the SFAC scores. So the, the, the thing that we appreciate about this is that we can adjust our <coughs> instruction based on this and we can see um, growth or areas of need in the next round of assessments. So um, our next slide is um, just a, the, some findings for the ELA, just a couple of overall uh, remarks. For the 2018 SVAC testing, um, some of the things that we noticed that might have been factors that there was there were some long-term subs and some turnover during the latter grades um, at Bel Air most recently, prior to my arrival. Um, but we did notice that in the fall Renaissance star assessment, um, it revealed that 34%, which was you know a third, which wasn't revealed in the um, SVAC, um, are at or above grade level currently. So that's great for second graders right now. Um, but we still have gaps in uh, third and fifth grade, but those are where 43 to 40% of the students are below grade level. Our next um, slide is um, a big picture of math. Um, I just want to remind you again, this is students from um, third and fourth grade last year that are our current fourth and fifth graders. Um, slightly better performing than in, in English language arts. Um, but one thing that we do like to, to note is that um, a lot of the instruction that's happening is are on the green and blue. Um, those are our focus students that we want to not only move in um, math skills, but also, um, as we saw in the language arts, those are our group that we want to move towards reclassification because they're nearing the um, criteria on SVAC. Um, this is a comparative slide for three years. It mirrors um, pretty much what happened in language arts, a growth from 15, 16 to 16, 17, and then a slight dip um, in 17, 18. Um, but we did notice that last year there were more exceeding or meeting standards, but it did remain higher than the prior year. So there was a dip, but it still is above what was going on in 15, 16. And this is the, the Red Star in math. Um, we can see our, our, our second graders are, are doing a little bit better right now. And our greatest gap right now is fifth grade, which, um, as I mentioned earlier, might be a reflection of some of the, the turnover that we had in staffing in fourth and fifth grade and long-term subs. Um, but we do have um, plans and some actions that I want to share with you how we can um, close the achievement gap um, at Bel Air. These math findings, um, again, for some long-term subs, we also uh, wanted to share that 40% um, of the second graders in math are above grade level, um, and the largest deficiency was in fifth grade, um, with 76% of students below grade level right now in November. Um, and overall, 37% of the students performed at or above grade level, which is higher than the SFAC scores of 23%. Um, the next graph is um, a reflection of our uh, LPAC. Um, the findings below, I know that the print is a little bit small, but 18% are well-developed and 38% are moderately developed, and those are the ranges that are nearing the reclassification criteria. Um, and 26% somewhat and 17 beginning. Um, the positive news here is that more than half, 56% of our students are performing um, on the higher end of the LPAC currently. And these are last year's uh, scores. Um, so specifically our math and ELA actions um, is that all students receive differentiated and small group instruction provided by their classroom teachers. In transitional and kindergarten classes, they are supported by a part-time instructional assistant. Uh, targeted students in first through fifth grades receive small group reading intervention um, with one of our early release kindergarten teachers or transitional kindergarten or a reading intervention teacher during the school day. Um, currently, all students have access to supplemental technology and adaptive programs that um, the adaptive piece is important because it can uh, go up or down and help the, the students progress. And all students, um, we have several programs to support math and language arts um, right now at Bel Air. Um, teachers continuously review formative assessment data. We have a um, well-oiled instructional leadership team, 
and um, we have a, a, a meeting again tomorrow, our second round of data dives. Um, and with those, we determine best teaching practices and design responsive instruction, instruction for implementation. Um, in our English language development, teachers develop, develop uh, differentiated instruction for ELD um, during designated ELD time. They examine strategies to develop instructional focus on language acquisition and reclassification. And we are currently um, embarking and launching the SEAL model um, with Alan and uh, TK at Bowlingwood in, in TK through first grade to support um, language and literacy. Our next snapshot is PD, and just to remind where our fifth graders um, in the district are uh, participating in a physical fitness test, they're assessed in aerobic cap uh, capacity, body composition, abdominal strength, trunk extension, uh, upper body strength, and flexibility. Um, go ahead. One note is that this was a fifth grade. These were fifth graders that are now in seventh grade. And like Dr. Sanchez, there's kind of a lag in when, when we can get the information back. But that's just kind of typical how the state has been with the physical fitness testing. Um, so those kids are at uh, Parkside right now. However, we can use those to determine our program. Um, in summary, the lowest category was abdominal strength. Um, upper body strength was one of the, the highest performing categories. And overall, most students are weak in five of the six categories. So we have a few things that, um, thanks to our Ed Foundation, we have the Rhythm and Moves program where um, every grade level gets two periods, 40 minutes each, eight minutes um, a week of physical activity. We have brought on providing family nutrition classes to not only Bella Elementary, but the preschool families. Um, and as much as we can, we remind students um, and families about our district wellness policy, especially around class um, parties and holiday time. Um, we recently participated um, with Rhythm and Moves an uh, annual move thon um, which was held out at our field, a great event. Um, and this year, as noted, we um, had our first community health fair, and another one is in uh, plan for the springtime possibly as well. So our showcase this evening, we've got some cameos here, uh, Mr. Ellis and uh, Ms. Menendez. Um, so just to um, give you a quick, quick overview of what SEAL is, it stands for Sobrato Early Academic Language. Um, and the SEAL model is supported by years of research um, and designed a, a comprehensive model of intensive, enriched language and literacy education design uh, for English language learners. Um, we have Mr. Ellis right there, kind of uh, kids are talking, in, improving their language and vocabulary. Our next slide on SEAL. Um, is showing that the um, professional development that these TK through kindergarten and first grade teachers, they're gaining um, professional development and workshop sessions, coaching, collaborative reflection, and um, planning time together. The model supports developing language literacy in their children and a, a very um, strong homeschool connection. Um, teachers are well on their way in implementing a strategy called draw and label in which the teacher talks about the concept, labels the image with academic vocabulary, vocabulary and then he or she, um, that, she, that he or she wants them to target and master. Um, there then the chart remains on the wall for the duration of the unit to become a, um, a resource in a rich and a print rich environment. Okay. So that's about um, all I have. I know it's a, a lot of information. Um, I welcome questions, and I just wanted to remind you, um, I know President Blanco noted we have a, a student council now. Those are our students that were held earlier, um, something that I don't think they've had at Bel Air for, for some time. So um, thank you for the opportunity. I'm honored to work with a wonderful staff um, and a very, um, a very embracing community that's been supportive in my past three months there. So thank you. Any questions? Um, for the chair, uh, great presentation, by the way. I love the pictures. Um, your page, your page is on numbered, so I'm going to start over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Page seven. It's the actions to do 
because we don't want to be spending money and, 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 and taking up staff time to go down a road where we're not going to get results. Um, the one other, just last question, what had to do with the LPAC um, pie chart. Mm -hmm. And is there anything that would help us to relate some certain things to well developed under the top so forth? Because some of the students have not all been in those programs for the same number of years, right? right. So we would expect the newcomer student right. or the long-term English language learner, um, which of course have different um, you know, instructional needs. Um, but we as a staff know, you know, teachers know who our, our students are, they know where their testing is, they use the LPAC, they use um, Pontus and Pinnell, they use the RENSTAR, um, you know, to kind of, to guide that instruction and those best practices. Our summer school program served over 55 students in all areas from preschool through eighth grade. We were staffed with um, six special education teachers, five um, paraprofessionals, eight behavior therapy aides, the support of um, a speech language pathologist assistant, our occupational therapist, a psychologist, and the behavior therapist, as well as having site administration and office the majority of the staff that, um, that served in the extended school year program were district employees. These are just some pictures of some of the activities that our, um, our preschool students as well as our extended school year students um, participated in. This is one of our preschool teachers, Jennifer Menendez who's doing an outdoor science experiment with her class. And bless students. Um, in this picture, we see another activity that our students participated in for extended school year. Um, Ms. Michelle Navales and Jennifer Malley led the students in doing tie-dyeing. So they were working on following multi-step directions and enjoying some uh, social time as well. This is another student. One of the strategies that they utilized um, with our students was um, taking hands on manipulatives to reinforce mathematics skills. And this is an example of one student in Ms. Quinn's class who was using tactile manipulatives to sort colors, which would be part of his goals. And um, some of the things that they included in this the summer school program um, was walking field trips to the library and to retail stores as well as visiting the fire department. The theme for all of summer was camping and so um, that's why we see the kids engage in a lot of outdoor activities 
And when you see some of the pictures, you can see they had tents in their classroom, um, and they used those to build vocabulary, create imaginative play settings, and promote science education. This next section is a little bit about our math acceleration program that was sponsored um, by ALEARN, Silicon Valley Education Foundation, and um, we also received a grant, a generous grant, from the Danford Foundation to pay for this program. The goals and objectives of this program were to build strategies to, ta to tackle difficult math pro problems. Students received one-to-one -one help from a teacher or a teacher's assistant. There, sorry. It's actually, it's on one-to-one -one student to teacher ratios. If there was a teacher assistant for every one um, a teacher. So I realize that reads wrong. Um, the, this was also an opportunity for our students to learn about their pathways to college and engage families in um, learning about pathways to college as well as developing a love of math by doing some hands-on activities. This slide just shows you a little bit about the demographics of our students who participated. The students who um, were invited to attend this program were students who fell in a very specific range where they were just on the cusp of becoming proficient um, based on their SBAP or CASP scores for the previous year in mathematics. So we invited um, those families uh, for their students to participate. We had 83 students who continued throughout the program, and of those, um, you can see the highest attendance uh, was in the eighth grade, and um, the, the grade level that struggled the most was in Some of the educational outcomes that we saw, which was very exciting, um, they were administered, or there was an administration of three formative assessments. These are called MARS tasks. They require students to perform at a very high level um, in terms of problems that require their persistence and perseverance. So as they move along through the problems, it becomes more and more difficult. These are in alignment to what is expected of students on the statewide testing. What we saw um, with these results, pre and post, is a great gain. Total scores overall, if you just take a, a snapshot look uh, for sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, um, well, for sixth and seventh grade, we saw a great gain in the pre, um, between pre and post assessment. One thing I did want to point out to you is task number three, um, the Silicon Valley Foundation, and looking at the data from all students in San Mateo County, they realized that the assessment for the pre and the post didn't align very well. Um, the first assessment asked students to apply a formula, so they were given the formula and kind of had to plug in the numbers. The second assessment was more in depth where they had to actually remember the formula as well as applying that algorithm towards solving problems. So they saw countywide that students were in all, through all of San Mateo, not San Mateo, through Silicon Valley in addition to San Mateo. So they served Santa Clara County as well as San um, Mateo and they saw a dip on those scores in every district. So that wasn't abnormal to San Bruno. Um, and it definitely skews our results, but it should be taken with a grain of salt because that was consistent with the law in the exam. These are just some pictures of our students who participated in the field trip to Stanford. Our students had an opportunity to go on a tour of Stanford and to learn a little bit more about different colleges as they um, proceeded through the program. One of the key features that I actually loved attending was the College Information Night. Um, and they also built in college readiness activities throughout the entire session as part of their um, daily schedule. At the, col at the College Information Night, um, 
what I found that was really unique and um, exciting was that you have parents of sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students who are taking notes on the financial aid process, who are taking photographs of the earning outcomes for students or for, for people who have differing levels of education. And so that was really exciting to see the parents so invested and we had great turnout of parents at those events. Um, and just in closing with the A-Learn, uh, we have some quotes from some of our students um, about what they liked best about uh, the learning. And one of the things that resonated was that students felt like they had an opportunity to collaborate with their peers and to become ready for the next level. Okay. And the last program that we had for summer school, but certainly not the least, is our foundation, <coughs> is our Big Lift Inspiring Summer Program, which are collaboration of Bell, um, San, Mateo, San Mateo County Libraries, and the Big Lift, as well as our school district. The program was from June 25th to July 20th. It was a full day program. We had 100 students in, um, as rising kindergartners, rising first graders, and rising second graders. So those were five clusters of students. The average daily attendance was 88%, which is fantastic, given that preschool and TK, those grade levels historically have less attendance than other grade levels. Um, what also was very significant is um, our gains. Our students made on average a growth of two months worth of gains in those four weeks of the program, which was higher than the county average. This is a little bit about the curriculum. It's inspired by the framework for the Bay Area Discovery Museum, which spells out create. And this program, um, or the, the framework of this program is about being um, child-centered, being friendly for risk, emotionally um, and developmentally um, appropriate, that students are active, that the time is flexible, and there's opportunities for exploration. So the typical day that you would see in a program um, from Bell, this is their framework. So each day starts with a community um, and family breakfast as part of the program, followed by literacy, mathematics, and an opportunity for lunch and recreation, STEAM activities, arts, and health. Um, and this is a full day program for our little guys, so all day long. And these are just some of the slides from um, their visits as well as from community members who came in to talk to students about their careers. And we've got a lot of pictures because they had a lot of opportunities. <laughs> the students in the BLISS program are referred to as scholars, so they start having that language of success that they're moving on in their, um, their education career. And you can see the kiddos are holding their little stars up, showing what their goals are for the future. And so as part of the early education programs, there's an aspect of a quality assessor coming in. And utilizing that Bell framework is how those assessors um, determine the appropriateness of our program that we're offering as well as how well we are doing. And they give, this, uh, they give feedback to our early education director on what they saw that were areas of strength. And so some of the things that, um, that they saw as areas of strength are noted up here but I'll just highlight that they saw an infusion of college and career activities embedded into all of the learning. They saw use of positive um, behavior supports as well as having a really organized program and using small group instruction to differentiate support based on students' academic needs. And the unique component of the Big Lift program and of the summer program is parent engagement. Using outcome surveys, 89% of families 
felt that they were more involved in their child's education. 93% of families indicated that they were highly satisfied, and 95% of families indicated that they would recommend inspiring summers to others. And given that we have 100 students, it's like 95 people. <laughs> Need some water. I know. <laughs> I do need some water. Well, think about any questions for Valerie regarding these uh, summer programs. No, I think it's an excellent report. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you again to Ms. Gies, Mr. Smith, and Ms. McGinn for their contributions. I, I have a com uh, I don't know if it's a question. I know it's a comment though, but um, for the program that we had, the summer program that we had at Parkside. I know that the math teachers all weren't uh, district employees. I know that the eighth grade teacher, math teacher, was the only one. So um, for next year, I'm assuming we're doing it next year. Yes. So is there, um, what are your plans to reach out to the sixth and seventh grade teachers so that they can teach that class during the summer? So whatever. Whenever we uh, offer any uh, extra duties, we always offer to staff first. And um, the reason that we did not have uh, this fully staffed by district employees is because we didn't have district employees apply to be a part of that uh, program. Okay. Well, my concern with that is I know that the sixth grade teacher, there were some issues with that teacher, and she was not a uh, parkside math teacher. So just take that into consideration for next year. I, I am excited to, to report to the team that we've already begun identifying students who are eligible for um, for the big lift. I'm not sorry, not the big lift for, for Elevate or A-Learn program for next year so that we can get that information to students and their families now versus waiting until the end of the year and trying to drum up um, interest. So working with Mr. Smith, we are getting that information out to students during this conference week so that their parents know, hey, this is an option for my child during the summer. So we're really excited about that. Sure. I yes. think uh, what's critical is this the summer lab and making sure that they get the gains so they don't lose track when they come back in the fall. I think this is very important. Absolutely, a regression factor. And the, the sorry. <laughs> Going. But with the A Learn program, it is a compacted program of what they can anticipate for the next school year. So it really gives them a head start on going into that next school year, which is why it's so critical that we continue to expand this program for students in lower grades. Absolutely. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So don't move, Valerie. Oh. I think we're here up next again. Right? Yes. So, F3, 2018 CDE California School Accountability Dashboard Indicators. to all LEAs, including 
charter schools, county office of education, and school districts. Individual school sites are not required to report out on local indicators. The whole purpose of having these five indicators where we choose to use a rubric and a tool to evaluate our own, pro our own progress is to create an accountability system with local uh, ownership and to help our community understand a holistic picture that's not just our state numbers. So our first area, when, when we log into the, the, when you log into the California School Dashboard, you see that it has these indicators and you report out on each of the areas that it asks about. In terms of identifying basic conditions, we've met all areas of this. This is um, in terms of having sufficient uh, we repair facilities, that our students all have their standards aligned curriculum materials, and that teachers are appropriately credentialed. For priority two, the implementation of safe <coughs> academic standards, we can either use a narrative summary or a reflection tool to determine our progress. The reflection tool is an option that allows us to rate our professional learning for teaching and for um, how well we're implementing the standards using our own walkthrough data from the classrooms and our feedback from the LCAP so we utilize the reflection tool because we feel it gives us a little bit better of a snapshot, and that's what we have in the previous years as well. So our results from that, from priority two, if you can move to the next slide. So the first in this area is in providing professional learning for teaching to the, the recently adopted academic standards and curriculum frameworks. This is not in regard to specific curricular materials. This is in regard, in relation to the actual standards themselves or the uh, framework. So we're required to rate ourselves from one being the exploration and research phase all the way up to full implementation and sustainability. So as you can see, we're in our initial implementation of our Common Core and our English Language Development Standards. We're fully implemented with our math common core standards, and we are in the beginning development for next generation science standards and history social studies, or social science. And this next um, area asks us to determine how well our actual curricular materials are aligned to those frameworks. And as you can see, um, all of our language arts, our ELD, and our mathematics um, curriculum is fully implemented to align with the newest standards or framework. The Next Generation Science Standards, we are in the process. Um, in January, we have a team of teachers who will be exploring some of the recently adopted uh, by the state uh, curriculum for teaching the Next Generation Science Standards and history, social science, we're also in the exploration, exploration and research phase. Uh, we have formed a committee that has agreed to pilot um, some of those state adopted materials. Actually, the first week of December, that committee is going to preview some of the materials that were adopted by the state and whittle that down to two different curriculum materials to pilot.
um, a little bit higher full implementation in mathematics, and we're still in the exploration phases for NGSS and history of social science. Okay. Another indicator that we're asked to look at is the success of engaging our teachers and administrators in training and providing them professional development. And we felt that we, um, and this is asking about last school year and how well we identified the needs of groups of teachers, how well we identified the needs of individual and the support that we've provided them for areas that they have not yet mastered. Priority three asks, uh, is about parent engagement. And this area allows districts to either um, administer a summative, sorry, <laughs> administer a survey, or use local measures to evaluate in a narrative form. We choose to use a summary here in San Bruno Park, which allows us to get uh, feedback from, from a large number of parents. This last year we had, um, of the 1,800 families, we had approximately 19% complete the survey, which is statistically significant in terms of response rate. So in this area, it's a, it takes on a narrative form. In identifying some of our key findings and why we selected this instrument. So as I just discussed, that we felt um, that continuing with the survey instrument was our best way of getting a large number of parent input regarding their engagement. My time's up. <laughs> um, this, this survey was developed to align with the, the, with the, with the framework of our LCAP. Our LCAP is around those three areas of conditions of learning, student outcomes, and engagement. And so our survey, our survey was vetted by our superintendent's advisory group and our DLAC in the prior year to more closely align that with the goals. And we continue to look at our survey to make sure that it's still measuring what we want to measure. Um, one of the key findings was that our parents felt that communication from from the, from the schools in the district were um, positive, or 88.3%. It was positive, it was open, and it was timely, and that was an increase from the prior year. Additionally, um, we met with advisory groups a minimum of five times per year with each the DLAC and the SAC committee. Our priority six is also measured using a local climate survey. This is given to the students as well as, well this one is specifically about the students, the previous was parents and community. And this one has to do with whether they feel safe and whether they feel connected. So the way that we report out on this is in a narrative summary of those results. And it's in a paragraph or less. So uh, what we report to the state is that our students are, the, significant, the most significant thing that uh, our response rate last year, this was given to four through eighth grade students, and we increased from the prior year where 11 students completed the survey to 833 students, <laughs> which is awesome. And that's over half of the students in fourth through eighth grade, more than half, 60%. Um, in that survey, we had 75, so about uh, three-fourths of the students felt safe in their, in their schools, 93% felt they had adequate materials to be successful, and a little bit over three-quarters felt that they, their classrooms were clean, and they indicated that they have never been bullied or cyberbullied or known anyone who has been bullied or cyberbullied. Okay. I don't know where that R came from, it's not online. <laughs> Um, 
Priority seven, this is new for 1819. They've never asked elementary districts to participate in evaluating our course access. So this year, they want to make sure that we are providing a broad course of study, which includes access for our unduplicated students to specialized academic instruction, or SAI, which is fancy terms for special education, and that we provide students with things such as ELD, or English language development, so that they can be successful in accessing additional curriculum. This is measured at the, um, at the high school level by enrollment in advanced courses, like advanced placement, college, college prep versus remedial, and um, IB classes. But this also has to do with our students' exposure to electives and enrichment when we look at the elementary level. So on this next slide, these are some suggested areas that we need to rate ourselves in terms of access for our students. Do all of our students have access? And if not, what are the barriers to attaining access? So we have to determine a tool that we will use um, to track student access for enrollment based on demographic group. Um, so the state and the county had a recommended tool that's just a simple spreadsheet where we can record the number of students who are enrolled in a specific course of study, um, as well as their grade level span and their participation in a significant demographic group. What we found this year as we were analyzing this, this data, because we haven't had to do this so far, but we did realize that there's a number of students who um, are impacted by needing additional support classes as designated by their IEP or their English learner status. Um, we realized that some of our students with IEPs were not having full course access to content areas. And so that's an area that we will grow in as we evaluate our current programs. And finally, uh, we realize that, and I just said this, <laughs> our students who have not attained English language proficiency by um, seventh or ninth grade are required to participate in ELD. And so that um, hinders their ability to participate in exploratory classes. And additionally, our students um, with disabilities, their IEP often designates their course of study. Um, so they might not have access to all content areas. And I've already begun discussions with Mr. Smith and his teachers regarding how we can um, provide a master schedule that ensures access to a broad course of study in the future. I have a question on that. Yes. When, are, when are we as a board going to discuss, to get a report about that meeting, about, about the master schedule for Parkside? So, um, Parkside is going to be coming to the board to give their um, school report, and so when they give that school report, that could be included in it. Okay. Are there any other questions about our local control, <laughs> local indicators? No, thank you very much. For the chair, uh, you mentioned exploratory classes. What does that mean, sir? Exploratory is just a fancy term for lactose. Um, Usually at the middle school, if you look at the research documents like Taking Center Stage or Caught in the Middle, which was its predecessor, they refer to those as exploratory, and the majority of the time those are ungraded courses on a wheel. So like you would have this, this quarter, you would have art, and the next quarter you might have career studies, following quarter, keyboarding, and coding. But it would be an exploratory course, so you have an option to um, to access multiple different uh, pathways for careers and for, for growth. So it's, that's what we do at the sixth grade level. They have that exploratory wheel. So it's electives, but it's in a different format. Is, is that all the exploratory wheels? Or is that all the classes you mentioned, or is there others? Music and... and it, it just depends on what's offered. Uh, those are just examples. But, um, I know Mr. Smith can speak more to what's offered specifically at Parkside when he does his presentation. I, I look forward to 
looking forward to that report as well. Um, what question? You mentioned science. It's, it's not, page numbers not here, but uh, priority seven, uh, social sciences and science. Oh, I have page numbers online. What was the question on this one? I'm sorry. I'm just curious, science is a broad term. Is that including ecology? Does it include botany, oh. biology? So it's science in science in the middle school in GSS science is um, is an integrated science. So um, it, it covers a variety of so physical sciences, uh, chemistry, uh, the earth sciences, life sciences. So we will have uh, you know, further information. You'll learn more of this um, through uh, board development. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. <coughs> and engineering programs. Awesome. And engineering. We're certain of the local measures, it seems like, I say that it's priority seven, but it seems <coughs> like there's credit essentially for identifying barriers, but not, not really in setting LEA targets and how did you do against it. That seemed almost like a theme in there, that there's not, it's like the fact that you're addressing it means that you're meeting it, but it's not, is there an ability for local measures to actually set our own targets? And then Correct, yes, so as we look at that, I think it'd probably be better if I would have pulled up for you guys a printout of last year's indicator. So it's determining growth from the previous year based on our own local indicators. And in terms of that uh, priority one, we've, we've been at that meeting in all of those areas um, in terms of good repair and having textbooks in regard to um, the positive climate. Uh, those are measured based on increases in our survey. So it'd probably be in reflection um, next year, I will provide you with the previous year's results at the same time so that you can see that those targets are met. In terms of priority seven, because this is the first year of implementation, everyone kind of gets a pass. <laughs> so it's just really about identifying the areas of need for the broad course of study. to DLAC and having 100% participation. So it was just to reference um, Mr. Martinez that from what I was at the meeting yesterday, and from my count, there was only two parents. One parent was a teacher, so I'm not sure. Um, she did mention she was a parent. I didn't see her as a DLAC member representing a, a parent, but actually as a teacher. But um, just to let you know, at least from my perspective and being on the DLAC a couple of years ago, it's important to have more parent um, attendance. And the reason I say that, because we did have one parent that mentioned that she was concerned that math and, um, that even though he understands the language, he, she wasn't too sure that he understood the math and the reading. And because our scores on CAS is low, then we should acknowledge the deal and just kind of um, put more attention to it. And so when you say 100%, from my perspective, yeah, we did meet a quorum, but did we really meet the quorum of, from the parent side? And it brings me back to how many, what's, so we allow, we want to give the parents 72 hour notice in the community for them to show up, but life happens and people, it's very hard to come to these meetings, but it's important to kind of um, do more parent outreach. There was a good um, good study session, and I was trying to record, but it's kind of hard to record three different groups at the same time. But it's um, one of the, I think it was the Portola principal that mentioned um, having a parent center 
just having somebody there so parents can just drop by at any time and ask questions and have resources available to them. And this is something, and I'm not sure if this is good at this point to mention, to work with the community, with the San Bruno um, Chamber of Commerce and see if they're willing to sponsor a location off of the school site, but just somewhere where we can offer information and just kind of um, guide them even for the surveys because we <coughs> say the surveys are really reaching the people that really need to do the surveys. So thank you. It's just my opinion. Thank you, Ms. McKinney. Getting nervous so I stutter. Okay, so moving on to action items. H one this table. Authorization for superintendent doesn't need to negotiate purchase and sale agreement for the school site that was table. H2, approval resolution 18-11-01 to establish a citizen, citizen's oversight committee, measure X. Okay, so great, great news, which all of you know, we um, were able to pass measure X. And when you pass a measure um, off of a ballot, you are required to create a citizen's oversight committee, bond oversight committee. And so that's what this um, resolution is, is uh, for the board to um, approve so that we can <coughs> establish this committee. Now, uh, do keep in mind that uh, it will not start until after we've actually sold the bonds, and therefore then the um, committee can oversee uh, that the bonds are being spent according to what the bond measure has required. Um, so this particular resolution, 18-11-01, um, to establish the citizen, Citizens Oversight Committee, um, it's very standard. Uh, when you look at other districts, this is exactly the same language that they use in the resolution, and the, this is just establishing it. The chair, so moved. displays of projects and money spent. So when we have construction projects, how will those be displayed and communicated to the public? Well, um, going back to what I have done, uh, what I've experienced in my past, um, when Mill Bray um, built the Taylor cafeteria slash um, multi-purpose um, they didn't have a lot of signage that the contractor that was doing the building, they did put up something to say it was being a building um, produced by this. 
They also do put up signage that says measure, in, in our case, measure X, uh, these are the projects that are happening. So we will probably have something like that um, on whatever <coughs> site that we're currently working on. Great, I think it's a good opportunity for the board and governance team to really collaborate and see what those signs look like and we can communicate that properly. Thank you. I have uh, concerns about this, um, about <laughs> the, uh, the, the bylaws. Any question is? Um, well, it's concerns, not questions. The process that is being presented to us and recommended um, to appoint these community members Previous leadership, what we did was the superintendent would ask the board members to refer, give names um, to to any committee, and um, because the board voted on this item, I feel that the board needs to be afforded the same opportunity as previous years on appointing such members to any committee. Um, so I'd like to propose that we give the superintendent uh, names and not follow an application process. And the other concern I have about this is in 5.2 section B, The committee may not include any employee, official of the district, current or former member of the board of trustees of the district or any vendor, contractor, or consultant of the district. We have an issue here because this is not an ed code. <clears throat> it's not an ed code. I'm going to cite it right now. <coughs> it's ed code 5282. Sorry, 15282. And it says, it is 15282, section B. An employer official of the school district or community college district shall not be appointed to the citizens oversight committee. A vendor, contractor, consultant of the school district or community college district shall not be shall not be appointed to the citizens oversight committee. Members of the citizens oversight committee shall pursuant to sections 35. 233 and 72533 abide by the prohibitions contained in Article 4 and those two sections of the Ed Code 35233 <coughs> that actually pertains to the school district. The other Ed Code 72533 pertains to the community college district and all that is is about um, conflict, uh, con conflict article. So I think we need to strike that. Uh, Jennifer, yes. what we have in the bylaws that you were seeing is exactly what you just read. No, we also have that you're saying that you're not allowing former board members to sit on this committee. That's not an ed code. Good chair. Yes. This oversees, oversees that. It does not. It's trying to make it an important process. Can, I'm but sorry, can I, how can this... Can I, Please finish Oversee that. This is Ed Go ahead. Please. I have to check. I have the floor at this point. You do it to me. Thank you. This regulation is to make sure that there's no bias in the process in terms of any conflict of interest. The application process is a very important process because it's going to get those community members and others that are part of this go through a vetting. Not just simply putting names, but go through a vetting process because this is a critical committee that the bond measure of the committee went out to do, went out to the public, door to door. There are people in this room that went door to door and made this point. And so this is very important to now change it. That's not so neither here or there, that's not 
the issue. What I'm trying to raise is this is an important document. This is going to be an important job for any community member who we as the board are going to decide to sit on this committee. And I'm telling you right now, this document does not supersede what Ed Code says. And, and, and Wendy, you are correct, but, but somehow the fact that any former board member, so that says, let's say John wants to sit on it. You know, I personally wouldn't have an issue with any former board members. We actually have, after tonight's meeting, we'll, we'll, we will be having three former trustees. And who knows, maybe they might be interested. I actually wouldn't mind having a former trustee sit on this committee. So again, that needs to be stricken out of this document. It's can not- I, Can I make a recommendation? I'd like to take this to legal counsel regarding this one yes, clause and see what the legal counsel would advise us. But we can go ahead and move forward to wait to make the appointments until after we've gotten advice from legal counsel. Okay, and for the chair, I think it's a great idea. Yeah. So we're going to table this because actually, I actually think that we should spend more time on this issue, this item. Um, I know that by law and in the Ed Code, it does say minimum seven members. I actually like to increase it by, by another number. So I don't know if you all want to have increase that number now or wait till we hear from council. Would you like for me to get, uh, get feedback from the council regarding changing the bylaws to reflect a larger number? But that's the thing, what's the budget? It's, it's, a, budget it's a minimum, it's not a maximum. Right. So it establishes a minimum requirement, not a maximum requirement. So do we wanna, okay, so we don't have to, we don't have to deal with that. We don't have to discuss that now. But I do have concerns of the way that we're um, appointing uh, committee members to our advisory committees. I, uh, in the past, I don't know if anyone's there shared this with you, Stella, but the superintendent has reached out to the board members and said, hey, give me two to three things. Give me the, give me the numbers. Um, I will see if they're interested. Obviously, we would reach out to these committee members and ask them if they're interested to sit on whatever committee it is, next committee. And, um, and uh, move forward from there. And this doesn't preclude for the board from giving me names of individuals that they think might be interested. But I, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm trying to avoid, what I want to do is avoid the application process. This way, it's, we have- These bylaws, um, I did research on these, and I um, used <coughs> prior comparable districts. These bylaws came from San Mateo Union High School District, and you know that they've had several bylaws. No, I understand. And there is something here that says the, these are the way that these um, members are um, actually uh, put in place. There are times, because I know from prior districts, there are times that there is not uh, enough people who are applying for this. So therefore, it would be the movement to the board to give um, suggestions to the superintendent. And those, all of those people would then be brought forward by the superintendent for the board to approve to be on this committee. But the first um, step that you have to do is you do have to do an application. You've gotta make sure that you don't have people that are uh, conflict of interest. You've got to be sure there are a number of uh, members that are to be required, and this is for the, the um, Ed Code, that are to be on the, this member. Um, and it says, one member shall be a parent or garden, guardian of a child enrolled in the district. One member shall be both a parent and a guardian of a child enrolled in the district and active in a parent-teacher organization such as a PTA or a school site council. One member active in bus uh, business organization representing the business community located in the district. One member active in a senior citizens organization. One member active in a bona fide taxpayer association. At least two members of the community at large. Those are the requirements of the, right. this be based right. on Ed Code that they are supposed to be there. And as you mentioned, you wanted to have more people on there. Um, that is perfectly fine, but they should be going through the application process unless you cannot find somebody to 
um, actually put in an application, then I think it is extremely prudent of the um, board members to uh, give, give those names to the superintendent so that she can bring it forward. For, right, and Chair, I actually also, oh, go ahead, Annie. Sorry, um, for starters, I have two things I want, I want to bring up here. One, um, thank you to staff for bringing it back to legal counsel to possibly revise and reference with that code. Secondarily, I don't care to suggest names for the Fallen Advisory Committee. I want it to be as independent as possible. I, I think it should be an oversight to us and what we're doing with this. So, 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 I, so I'm hoping that you'd be open to having a subcommittee created so that that subcommittee will bring those recommendations to the board. And also I wanted to do, I wanted to also mention, I did my research as well. I did call the CDE again about this issue. And um, during my research, I asked about application process. There is, I have been speaking with this one particular person. I asked, I said, well, you know, we're looking to do application process. She's like, I haven't heard about that. So if you can share with me um, where exactly you got your information, besides what the school district did, and that's great. We're not San Mateo High School District. We're a very small school district. Um, so we can do I actually same with any Millbury. I in almost every district that I have gone and I've been uh, participating in, where they have done a bond measure and they passed the bond measure, the uh, Citizens Bond Oversight Committee had an application process to be able to have people on that committee. Okay, that's that's great, Millbury. But I'd like to see an Ed code. Where does it say that we have to go through an application process? And if it's the will of the board to move forward with doing an application process for another yet committee, um, we I feel I think that we should form a subcommittee on having board members on this committee so that board members recommend um, to the rest of the board on who these uh, these appointments are going to be. That's your, the conflict of interest that you're reducing at this point, and you want to have no conflict. Having board members from a previous generation of board is a conflict of interest because they have their own interests, whether they were against the bond or for the bond. Okay, well, with that being said, I'm sorry, Henry, I, I'm sorry. I, I know the reason why we did it. I'm just going to go out and say it. It's because we have four board members that may have been against the Measure X. And for myself, this is not about whether I support Measure X or not. That's not what I'm trying to discuss here. But I feel that this was deliberately included in here. But if you want to read the Ed Code, I can pass it down to you. I'm not a book here. I read the Ed Code, and you're misquoting it. No, I'm not. Misinterpreting it. I would I'm sorry, Jennifer. I have to make exception. Yes. I, I do not feel that you tell me that I'm doing this on purpose to cause problems. I then we need to take. This. Then we need to take out. We need to strike out. We will seek okay. legal counsel on this and bring it back to the board. So, for the chair, I think that's a great idea. Okay, so so let me just summarize. So we'll we'll table this to the next meeting. We'll get legal advice regarding five point two, whether that is a valid to be included in the bylaws for a um, citizens oversight committee for Measure X. And bring this back to the board for um, for discussion and, and decision at the next board meeting. And also, I want to see about the application process. Okay, thank you. I want to see Ed code. All right. Uh, you Ed code right there. Thank you, Chair. Perhaps since since we've identified that there are different approaches um, to um, whether it would be a subcommittee or whether it follows through some other way. That, I'd suggest maybe that we have um, alternate um, motions so that we can actually take, make choices. In, in other words, once you have advice where there are choices that have been identified tonight, that we actually come back with motions okay. and then take them piece by piece, and then we'll end up with the full process. Does that make sense? Yes, I, yes. I think we already have. We'll separate the motion. Right. We'll yeah. separate yeah. them so we can put them back together and arrive. Right. Right. So bring one back for the bylaws, bring the second one back for the resolution. Okay. Hold on. 
not establishing it tonight, then? Yeah. No, we're going to take the lead. We have legal counsel to ask some questions. Um, One other just a, a notice that since this was um, predicated on selling bonds, then it's not um, it's not time sensitive yet. Right. Correct. Correct. All right, so we should be brought back. So next item, H3, new job description, behavior specialist supervisor. That one. Find interesting is that 
we're, we're going to talk about 92,000 to 116,000. Um, Pacifica, it's around 95 to 123. Early game is more affluent than here. Lower, 81,000, it's 114. So I know it's, you're getting a median point there. I just, I'm always going to ask these things because it does concern me. Um, the fact is that the Berlin game stood out as like, well, they're, they're paying the same person. Actually, I don't know that it's exactly okay. the same because each district has a different um, duties on their, their job description. And so I cannot tell you that it's exactly apples to apples. Sure. And when we talk about when we talk about the salary schedule and I notice every job position comes up, there if you go to the city of San Francisco's website, they'll say behavioral specialists and they'll they will give the actual range. So anyone who can read will say this is the range. And I understand there is, again, thank you, Kevin, but that's, someone has to go and look that up. I'm just saying, for transparency, is it better to always put the range, the actual? Yes, because the salaries, the salaries change when we go into negotiations. If we didn't put the range on there, then, it, then we, would have, uh, we would have to update every job description every time we had salary changes. Sure. But you also always put the range. That's why you can learn. When we actually um, post these positions, we would put the range, salary range, on the posting. The, the on the actual job posting. On the actual job posting. That's why when posting. we approve the job, it's going to have salary range, salary schedule. Yes. Okay. Yes. But when you but post the job to, job to a public website, yes. saying here's a job, you can apply to it, it's going to have the, the range. It's when you post it, yes, it will have the range. When you look at just the job description, it may say range classified management schedule. And then you would have to go and look at the classified management schedule and look for that particular uh, job um, job name title. All right. Okay? And that's, that's a normal process with any district. And um, this particular case also is a little unique because, as I told you, it's not a new position. It is the current position being held by the behavior therapist specialist will be moved into this position because that other the specialist position is being eliminated under CSEA and being put <coughs> into the dev So it. it's technically not a new position. It's just going from being classified to classified management. Furthermore, this table is, like, for example, CSA, it just changed in the last, you know, it changed, it's such a great, it, the whole table changes at once, essentially. Like, yes, whenever you have increases, the, the salary um, schedules do change. And the salary schedules are posted on the website. To the chair, I want to make a motion to so move. Okay, second. Second. All those in favor?
Building Science or Administration under the ECHO that we said referred to here. Thank you. Um, H4, updated job description, Program Secretary of Special Education. Again, this is um, not a new position that the job description had not been updated since 1994. And so we are bringing it back. One item that we did change on this, it was an 11 month position. We are um, want making it a 12 month position because um, it is required for the uh, director of special education to have an assistant throughout the entire year instead of just 11 months. So um, we're asking for this job description, updated job description to be approved. Um, and it will reflect that it is um, a 12-month uh, position and um, it's actually not a new position. It's just an updated job description. Move the chair so moved. May I have a second, please? Second. Okay. Any questions on this item? Okay, hearing and no request to be heard twice. Uh, all those in favor to approve this item? Aye. Aye. Aye.
want to extend the meeting. So, Through the chair, make the extension to 11 p.m. So, 10.30. Through the chair, yes. according to the board regulations, we can only extend the meeting once. So, okay, we, can stay, we can stop it at 10.30 if we finish our business, but 11 a.m. May I have a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so we have um, H6, January board meeting date changed to January 16th from the 9th. Uh, one of the, we, we've already approved the calendar for uh, the rest of 2019 school year. Uh, we realized as we were uh, preparing for the January board meeting that it is scheduled for the first week back from winter break. Uh, traditionally, the board meeting for January is moved to the second week online winter break, uh, which is uh, uh, outside. It's the third week of the month. Right. Yeah, we usually don't catch that one until the after. <laughs> so, Do the chair so moved? Yes. <clears throat> May I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. All right. First reading of board policies discussion. That is John and Andy and Philip. We are meeting the other night. Thank you, Andy. We are meeting the other night. I'll just go over a few of them here. I'm sure you have some also. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. I'll go over three of them that I found the most interesting. One of them I did find interesting because we're talking about tonight is uh, the term for the next trustee is going to go from my end on December 7th, and the next one will be on December 14th in 2020. I found it interesting. We were talking about my last day, and that same night we had that conversation. So. Uh, the other one we have um, AB 2009. It was talking about the emergency action plan. And for us, for our athletic competition, for us, the park and rec does that for us. And let's see the other one I had over here. And another one I found interesting, AB 406, is for charter schools after July 1st, 2019. They have to be operated. Uh, I'm sorry, what's the place for us? Uh, what's that called? For him, I'm sorry, that's where I'm over. Get prohibited from being a for profit corporation or organization. Thanks, Thanks. Andy. Thanks, John. Um, what I found interesting with transitional kindergarten so, uh, board policy 6170 uh, is revised to align with state language. Uh, it allows districts to place four year old children enrolled in the CSPP program into a TK program and to commingle children in both programs in the same classroom. Under Again, I, I was every time John and I go over this stuff, it's great to just see the state language and aligning our, our board policies. There's another one about expulsion, yeah, yeah, yeah. expulsion. Um, it kind of it kind of protected the rights of um, young children from being expelled. I believe it was kindergarten or correct. Yeah, so it's it's really a, kind of a safeguard. And then there's another one about athletic competition, but that's, yeah. Thanks.
Okay, any others? No, I, I heard those. Right. Through the chair. The motion, yes. To make the motion to uh, move forward with the modified form five, six, and seven, and pass the rest of the consent agenda. Okay. Do okay. we have a second? And a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Services, Mr. Rich Levine. Oh, Mr. Chair, so moved. <laughs> Second. Okay. Um, before we, would you like to come up and say something? I'm sorry. Let's take the word. Sorry, it was getting late. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 card statement for uh, August 22nd, but I have not gone back to uh, look at all the, the reasons for the justification for the, expend, for the expenses. But is there a way uh, to include, I mean, I appreciate that you did give some information on the expenses, but is there a way to be a little bit more specific? And I don't know if you were able to find out how else we can. I honestly would, if there was a way just to include the statement, I think that would be able to, I think that would fix the situation. But I know there's hesitation on just including the statement. So Stella, I know you said you were going to be asking around to see uh, how we can include this and be transparent with this, uh, with our credit card, Mr. Credit card. Well, um, you know, the district credit card is utilized by a variety of uh, various staff throughout the district, and there are checks and balances in place um, regarding expenditures that are, um, that, are, that are used for this card. So bringing this credit card statement and attaching it uh, as part of our, uh, our warrant warrants is actually not advisable, and I've checked with uh, the superintendents in the San Mateo County uh, group, none of them do this. Uh, this is not a standard practice. Uh, if there are questions regarding credit card charges or whatnot, these can be brought forward to, uh, to the business office and anybody is uh, welcome to stop by and take a look at them if there are any questions regarding that. But 
uh, rest assured Wendy has a process in place to verify that appropriate charges are being made and that they are aligned with the district's uh, goals and operations and uh, there's ethical use of the district credit card. I, I appreciate that, but again, um, for transparency regarding this particular item, I'd like to see a different way of presenting the credit card expenses and just re re just a real general reasons on what we're using the credit card for. So um, I, I think maybe we can ask one of our attorneys, I'd be willing to call our attorney and find out if there's a way to include this. Uh, there's some way to include it in the warrants. And I, and um, I, I, I mean, the community wants to go in, so let's say we do put in the, let's just say, uh, that we do put a copy of one of the statements in, and if the community wants to go and review and see what the justifications are on these expenses, then that, that's great, but I'd like to just, have a find a way to present it to the community and have it um, included in our board agenda. So I, I um, like to see just a little bit more research done on this topic, if possible. So that was my, my question and comment. That's all I have for this item. I, I have an idea for the chair. Is there an opportunity for you to meet with Wendy to go over uh, itemized credit card statements? Well, I, I, that's, a, that's actually something I can do myself and I do have questions I can go and ask her. Okay. But right now, all I have is just one copy of the, they did say I was going to go in and look, but there is a stack of, in, of paperwork uh, on the, you know, the expenses. Okay. So I, I just want to caution the board about getting into the weeds and, and stepping outside the role of the school board. It is not the role of the board to serve as an oversight. Uh, this, you know, as a superintendent, this authority has been delegated to me to uh, provide oversight in the in the um, expenditures of district funds, and and I've delegated that authority to Wendy to uh, make sure that we're following within the guidelines because we have auditors that come in and audit these things to make sure that we are following the guidelines that are established by the state of California regarding expenditures and, and use of district funds. So in the report that we have tonight, and if you look up on the screen, she has delineated some, some big buckets of where the expenditures of the $15,000 credit card statement, what those expenditures were and what kinds of things the cards are being used for. So, um, you know, it, it, again, you know, this is, the board is stepping into the weeds and uh, operating outside the role of the school board. Uh, people are more than welcome to stop by and take a look at the credit card statement. Uh, I'm happy to get uh, to get a statement from the attorney regarding this. But again, that again will be a charge to the district for asking them for several hours of their time to investigate um, this uh, the, the ask of the board. Well, actually, Stella, I disagree with your with your comment and your statement. We are the board. We are entrusted to answer to our community, and we are not. And if we have to, if we feel that, if we feel that we need to get into the weeds then we will. Um, I, I, to the chair. I'm not done, Henry, I'm sorry. But we, I will let you know, thank you. Thank you. We were voted in to answer to our community. I just hope that we as board members do not forget that. I'm done now, Henry. Uh, thank you, Chair. Andy, I'm Henry, I'm the board, sorry. Oh, okay. And the governance handbook, it states Sorry, but who's talking about? I'm not saying I'm not saying anything about mismanagement. I'm just talking about being transparent. But you're making that implication. I, no, I'm not. Yes, if I want Henry, sure. I think you and I have served on this board long enough that if I want to say something, I will say it. I do not need to imply or have you guys uh, 
read between the lines. I don't beat around the bush. So, um, Emmy, you have something to say? For the chair, um, I have one question around Sambor utilities. Um, typically, this number hover, covers around 20,000 per month. Now we're at 30,000. Is, is there any, that delta, is it, is it explainable? we have the presentation that, that Sarah had um, provided and would have made if she um, were up to it. Um, just would, would ask you to, to um, take a look at that and see if it was responsive to what, what you expected. Sure, yes, I will. And then we'll yes, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that. Okay. Any other? So I just wanted to say, just mention that because of the Thanksgiving holiday, we're, like, we're losing about three or four days of prep time for the next board meeting. So if the board could uh, get me feedback on the presentation that was prepared, mm -hmm. and uh, by the first month, the, fir the last Monday, so right after Thanksgiving, so I can pass it on to staff so they can be able to get that ready. Thank you. All right, so um, we have a future meeting, let's see, future business, we do have some, we 
reports that were going to be provided to the board, the facilities maintenance report in January, and the second was feasibility for the study of bilingual education in February. Then our next meeting is Wednesday, December 12th at Parkside at 7 o'clock, open session, and I want to wish everyone who is still here happy Thanksgiving, enjoy your time with your family, and Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right. Well, meetings adjourned.